on and off, we've been going through the sermon, Hebrews. And we're nearly finished. <coughs> and we're on the Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> starting at <coughs> verse 1. So unfortunately, Bible bit's not working again. So if you've got phones, you've got iPads, you've got pads of any nature and any other make or model, Samsung, um, Nokia, not wishing to uh, go to Hebrews chapter 12. Or if you have what is a good old trusty, does not break down, called paper, do turn to that. Hebrews chapter 12. Quick week recap. This is it's called the letter to Hebrews, but it's it, it feels more like it's a sermon. And it is uh, to a church that is being greatly persecuted. They're weary, they're tired, they're getting hammered from the authorities, their own family and friends. The sort of, why all this Jesus stuff? Come back to the family faith. Come back to whatever, Judaism. In our case, we could go on, we could say Hinduism, we could say Islam, you know, that sort of, if you want to put it into a more, slightly modern day, uh, current context. And the preacher has been trying to convince everybody for the last 11 chapters that Jesus is better. Better than anything else. And we looked at the heroes of faith in chapter 11, or heroines as well. One should not just mail it down to men, as there's some ladies mentioned in there as well. And we looked at the fact that they were persecuted, really, for their faith in God, and yet they endured to live for God. They carried on, and they didn't mind looking like weirdos for the Lord. <coughs> Remember the term weirdos? I quite like that as a modern term, because we're meant to look weird for the Lord. But these heroes and heroines of the faith in verse 39 of chapter 11 states that they did not receive the promise that God has promised. The one that we have got, that we have a promise. Do we not? A Sabbath rest coming. Do you remember I talked about last time about pulling from the future into the present and how we live our life? We need to pull in that future promise and how that reflects in our current life. But they are that God has something better in mind. And not just a good reputation. And these heroes and heroines of the faith that the, the preachers going on about haven't yet quite received the full perfection, the full salvation. They're waiting for us. Because we've got something better promised. At which point we <coughs> should go, amen. amen. Okay, no then, maybe not. So we're going to carry on. So verse 12, uh, chapter 12 Verse 1 to 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, these huge crowd of witnesses are these people of faith that he was talking about earlier. To the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honour beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. <coughs> Therefore, because we have something better, we have these great examples of heroes and heroines of faith, let's take a leaf out of their book, is what the preacher is saying, and let's strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily entangles. Now it's at this point that I wish to take a breather and look at this verse again. Because I don't know about you, but every time over the years I've read this verse, I've always tripped to, straight to, and every sin that entangles. Every sin that trips you up. Somehow, that's always gone, Hur! in my face. Sin, yes, sin. And then felt really awful afterwards. 
But there's something I've noticed for the very first time, really properly, really got highlighted to me. It's this. Strip off every weight that slows us down. Now, if you notice, Carlin was using words already about dropping stuff off. So we decided maybe God is talking this morning because we hadn't communicated before this morning. So here's a real question. What is the weight that can slow us down? I'm actually asking a real question this morning. <coughs> and I want a real answer back. Because what I've noticed, and the commentaries back this up, I'm glad to say, there are actually two separations. Weight is not necessarily a sin. It's very different. So, what is the weight? Well, what weight can slow us down? Worry, fear. Yeah? Guilt. Guilt, yeah. Failure. Failure, thank you. Culture. Culture. Oh. Do, do you want to unpack that just a little bit more there, Tim? Is that right? He's a member of the leadership team, that's why I can thank you. We don't do it like this. We don't do it like this. Ah, okay. Traditions. Shame. Shame. Shame, okay. Forgiveness. Whoa, good, this is good. Keep going. Forgiveness. Well, unforgiveness or forgiveness can weigh you down? Okay. Thank you, Daryl. Unhappiness. Unhappiness, yeah. Flesh. Okay, we'll come to maybe our sin later. Our flesh. My flesh has weighed me down. I could barely stand for a while. I was decorating all day yesterday. And my, my feet are hurting. Anybody else? Anger, yeah, that's probably towards a sin as well. But yeah, we'll come back to that. Thank you. Too much love of money. Too much love of money. Amen. <laughs> Challenges. Okay. Life issues. Yeah. Burdens of life. Sorry, Mum, what was that? Past guilt. Past guilt, thank you. Lack of faith. Lack of faith, okay. And life issues, you said, yeah. And burdens, burdens, and burdens. of life. Fear for okay. other people think. Sorry? Fear for other people think. People are fit. Keep going, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to keep repeating them. This is brilliant. Keep going. Friends. Huh? Friends. 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 And I, this is not for me, I hasten to add, do not think for one minute that I'm talking about something coming from my neck of the woods, alright? This is, this is something I felt as I was preparing. And this really can sound very difficult, and, there's, and I say this knowing that when one preaches, you use broad brush stroking. Okay? So there are always individual pastoral and personal circumstances when I say this. At which point now you're all like, <gasps> brace yourself. People can be a burden. There are some people who literally suck the life out of you over many, many, many years. Yet, you feel obliged, note the phrase I'm using, obliged to continue to be there at their beck and call Yet there is no change in their circumstances. And quite frankly, <coughs> there never will be why you continue to be their comfort blanket. I would also say that part of your oblige is actually it fulfills a need in you that's incorrect. The reason you're looking after this person or happy to be their constant beck and call, even though you moan about it and it wears you down, there's a need in you that's being fulfilled, that shouldn't be, that only God can fulfill. Now that's broad brush stroking. I will say this again, really dangerous stuff. And if God has spoken to you at that moment, and you're not sure whether he has or not, come and see me later. And I mean it quite sincerely, I'm not worried about it. For me, there is the other thing that weighs us down, which 
is a combination of a command from the God, do not worry, but is also unnecessary anxiety. <laughs> Some of us can run around with anxiety running as a background program in our head all the time. Mm. That weighs us down. Negativity. Cynicism. Oh, that's a biggie. We think we're being um, deliberately, how can I put this? Uh, 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 yes, let's challenge that. Let's criticise that. Let's, Because I need to think. But actually it's coming from a backdrop of lack of positivity. And if we view life with a real cynicism, that weighs us down. Because we get to that point of saying, well, that cannot be done. That's never going to happen. And so actually in our prayer life, we come from that backdrop of, that's never going to happen. That's a weight that we don't need to carry. The weight of I'm not ready for baptism. Now that's a weight that can really hold you back. There's no such thing as not ready for baptism. If you think Jesus is your Lord and Saviour, you get baptised. <coughs> so I want to pause right now. And for yourself, because you all did some really great contributions, that's fantastic. S sit here for a minute and actually talk to the Lord about the weight. <coughs> Right now, just sit and talk quietly to him and give it to him. Okay, let's move on to the next bit. The bit that we can't avoid, we do have to discuss it. And it states, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Now the entire analogy here is that, that, that the author, is, uh, the preacher is using, is that we're in a race. And it clearly would be a running race by the looks of it if you're tripped up, yeah? So, as part of that analogy, I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's saying here, as we said already, as it's stated already, that our focus should be on Jesus, the champion and perfecter of our faith. So if we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we say this all the time at church, if we, we keep praying, we will want to sin less because we want to do what God wants us to do. Does that make sense? So, you, it's on God who you're focusing. You don't focus on your sin and think about, I must stop doing that. You focus on Jesus, and everything should naturally, spiritually dissi dissipate. That's a terrible wording, Warren. You know what I mean. Disappear. Meld away. But let's be honest and real. We all have habitual sins. We all have something. Oh, look at that cat on the roof. Oh, he's sweet. <laughs> the distraction of animals is maybe mine. Oh, sorry. So anyway. Um, so this I do love that. Anyway, um, we all have these habitual sins. And sometimes that sin has not been dealt with. I realise why I'm struggling. Come on, Will. So I'm sitting there thinking, why am I struggling to look at this? Focus. It's because it's too low. And it's not going to go any higher. Alright, sorry about that folks. Sorry for the distraction. So, we all try and get around our sin. I don't know about you, but we try and work around it. Or we try and diminish the size of it. <coughs> try and pretend it's not there. It sort of reminds me of an iceberg, really. You sort of see it there and you don't think it's that big. But actually, underneath, there's about 90% of the iceberg. So we try and diminish the size of it, but the size of it is really humongous underneath. And we may justify, so when it's not that bad... We get away with this fact we think that God sees sin the way that we do. 
He sort of grades it. He doesn't, it's all the same. But the sin, what the, the uh, preacher here is using is sin that trips us up. He's seeing sin here, a particular sin maybe, one that is literally shackled to us. Does that make sense? It's not one that's waiting for us somewhere along the racetrack just over there that's suddenly going to go, ha ha, I got ya. It's one that we actually know about and it is shackled to us. It is one that has tied us down and we know about it. The problem is we try and avoid it all the time. We try and ignore it. So, I don't know about you, now I've never personally tried this. Um, I do know that um, apparently in some places when you're in various uh, uh, institutions, uh, like uh, being arrested or something, in America it's sometimes they actually shackle. Have you seen the movies when they've got the, when they're shackled down here, yeah? Down on their, their ankles. They, the idea is to not make them go very fast, isn't it? So they can't run away. So that's the sort of image for me that this is. This, this is one where it's shackled to your ankles. So you, you, you can't run, it's tying you down. And we're meant to run this race. It's something we've allowed to remain. We have not dealt with it with the Lord. We've not tried to remove the shackles. So sometimes we have to actually own up and acknowledge <coughs> that we have this problem in our lives. The Lord knows we've got it. We know we've got it. Really doesn't matter all the time if the whole world doesn't need to know we've got it. But it is shackling us, tying us down. So how do we get there a little bit? Well, as it says in verse 2, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion and initiator that perfects our faith. Now I have to say at this point, I'm going to say this, the, the, the analogy of running a race doesn't do it for me particularly well. <coughs> One reason only, I don't run. It's not one of my greatest skill sets. It is not how my muscles are developed. I can't run. I was normally always, mostly, normally the last or the penultimate runner going around a track at school. But as my teacher once said when he eventually saw me swim, <coughs> Aha! We found something, McNeil, you can do. You can swim. Yes, sir. So I prefer swimming. Now, I like swimming, but i got to say, I haven't been swimming properly for six months now. Oh, nobody having a go at me? Okay. Various reasons. Just about to get back and I have a health issue. All the building up there, let's not discuss that. All the bad weather. All Christmas. You know, there's lots of excuses one could come up with. But quite frankly, I just got out of routine. And I found it very, very difficult to get back into the routine. So the problem is, discipline has sort of gone out of the window. Then I had some right nagging from Joy. Right nagging, as in it was correct to nag me. <laughs> and also some of my swimming pals started to text me and go, where are you? They're the lane police are on you. We call ourselves the lane police. <laughs> so anyway, um, I've returned recently and actually Joy has encouraged me by going with me. Ooh. Ooh. To praise my wife up. <laughs> and I think this is called discipleship in my head. <laughs> because somebody's going along with you. They're walking or swimming alongside you. Okay. So that's the whole point. I actually think it's really encouraging. When I saw that, I thought, this is a good analogy of what I was talking about two weeks ago, that we are to disciple each other. You have to walk alongside someone. Same thing. So, problem is, I got in the pool, and I'm lacking in stamina. Not speed. <laughs> just stamina. Can't keep up the whole mile on my own. So, um, I've discovered that actually... Currently, to get myself back there and fit again, and for various reasons, that if I actually follow one of my swim pals and stare at his feet as I am swimming behind him, that keeps me going for the whole 1,600 metres. Isn't that right, Joy? Thank you. She's nodding. Because she's watched it and observed it. So I actually found that's really helpful. And it's because I am staring at him and focused on him ahead of me, it has kept me going and on the straight and narrow. Yeah, we do turn and come back the other way. But I keep on him all the time. And actually, that's like keeping our eyes on Jesus. 
Keep him focused on him. And you can focus on his feet, on the cross, focused on him and what he has done, being the champion, perfect of our faith, the one who has achieved everything that we are promised, keep focused on him, we'll keep going. And the sin, all right, this is where the analogy falls down a little bit in swimming, where the sin that so easily entangles and shackles around our feet, that goes because we're focused on him. We own up to it, we admit to it. So if I had to own up, I've basically been undisciplined after a while. Yes, there was true, there was illness, sickness, but after a while, I just got lazy. When we own up to that, and then I follow my friend, that's great. And so that's like a discipleship again, because I didn't follow him. Now what's going to happen in, is in about two weeks' time, I'm going to overtake him. I mean that with no pride whatsoever. It's the truth, isn't it? That, that, uh, I can't say his name, because he's being filmed at the moment. But he's waiting for me to overtake him. Because I am faster. But that's fine, because he can't wait, because he knows then he can sit behind me, and he'll follow my feet at my pace. And that's what we are meant to do, by the way, brothers and sisters. There are times that we have to follow the example of somebody else for a while. Yes, it's Jesus all the time, but there might be somebody else that we think, actually, do you know, that's a Christian, I want to just learn from them and go behind them for a while. But then it might be, after a while, you overtake them. It's not overtake as in, but it's the best analogy we get. You overtake them, and then they learn from you. That's called discipleship. <coughs> and we learn from their example. And maybe there's been something in their life that they've taken time to drop off and get rid of. We can learn with, from them the process. I think, isn't it, in Alcoholics Anonymous and all that, you have a mentor that walks with you and people get around you and encourage you all the time? Same sort of thing. So keeping our eyes in Jesus, keeping our relationship with us, will help us become unshackled from whatever habitual sin that we have. And also to drop the stuff that is weighing us down. And Jesus is our example. He saw the long marathon that is called life. And he did not give it up for short term pleasures. He saw it and endured it to the cross. So that you and I could be free. Verse 3. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Even then you won't become weary and give up. And I suppose here for me quickly that you're, the, the preacher here is saying, basically, you know, pick yourselves up. Don't give up. Look at what Jesus did. He endured absolutely hostility from so many different people. He continued to going. Maybe that Jesus gave up his life for you. You've not even struggled with your sin until death. But Jesus dealt with our sin in his death. So the very least we can do is maybe work on giving up our sin with him. Because he has set us free. Anyway, moving on. Verse 5 to 12. I'm going to rush through these deliberately because there is this sort of conclusion I want to come to. And you have forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to his children, he said. My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. As you enjoy this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who is never disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits? And live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us, so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it's happening, it's painful. But afterwards there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet, so that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. Remember, this is going to people who are awaiting the Jewish Messiah. So the chunk of this is to Jewish converts. 
the nation of Israel. People who saw that every time there was persecution or disaster, they would interpret that as the Lord is disciplining them. Being exiled from Jerusalem was a part of that package. They had gone wayward as his children, get a stick on the great path, but actually for a while I've got to discipline you. <coughs> so you can imagine that maybe for the church here, they're thinking maybe we've gone wayward. And partly, I suppose, the fact that they are wavering in their faith and not quite on track looking at Jesus all the way, they are falling off the path. Or they're sort of drowning in the pool. So they're sort of seeing that it's not quite right. And so therefore then there is some disciplining going on here. But what I love in this, and I don't know about you, but I don't like discipline. It's not fun, is it? Do you know what? I've actually turned the heating virtually off. <laughs> so, I don't know about you, but I don't particularly like being disciplined, especially by the Lord. That's because it can feel oppressive. It can feel like the Lord's really got a heavy hand on us. But, in this passage, and this is the bit I love, is actually, when you're being disciplined by the Lord, rejoice! When you're being disciplined by the Lord, rejoice. Why? Because he's saying, you are my child. I actually give a hoot about you. I want you to be on the right and straight and narrow. So therefore then, that's why I'm disciplining you. Because you are my child. I love you. There should be a resounding amen at that point. Amen. I know there's a lot of people's immediate jumping of the idea. I'm sure when I was a child, the very few occasions, and they literally count on my hands how many times I was disciplined. See, because I'm such a good kid. The, um, the uh, you know, when you realise it's your loving parents that are doing it to you because they love you, perfect. It's taken me nearly 48 years to get to this point. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But actually, in the Lord, when you look at it, it's because God is saying, you're my child. Rejoice. So when, I, when we sing, no longer a slave, I am a child of God. Whoa, that's brilliant. God wants the very best. And let's carry on with that for a minute. He likes to pull us back. So what's going on here with the Lord? Well, this is interesting. In verses 12 to 13, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet. So that those who are weak and lame will not fall, but become strong. What the preacher is quoting from is close to Isaiah 35. And I'm going to read all of it, so just listen, and then I'll be finished. Even the wilderness and desert will be glad in those days. The wasteland will rejoice and blossom with spring crocuses. Yes, there will be an abundance of flowers and singing and joy. The deserts will become as green as the mountains of Lebanon, as lovely as Mount Carmel or the plain of Sharon. There the Lord will display his glory, the splendor of our God. With this news, strengthen those who have tired hands and encourage those who have weak knees. This whole from Isaiah is about the promise of restoration of hope. <coughs> Say to those who are fearful, be strong and do not fear. For your God is coming to destroy your enemies. He is coming to save you. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. Oh, that sounds familiar to Isaiah 61, doesn't it? The lame will leap like a deer and those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wasteland. The parched ground will become a pool and springs of water will satisfy, satisfy the thirsty land. Marsh grass and reeds and rushes will flourish where desert jackals once lived. And a great road will go through that once deserted land. It will be named the Highway of Holiness. Evil minded people will never travel on it. They will only be for those who walk in God's ways. Fools will never walk there. Lions will not lurk along its course, nor any other ferocious beast. There will be no other dangers. Only the redeemed will walk on it. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing. 
crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. Amen. Amen. What the preacher is doing by dragging just that very straight verse out of verse 35 is saying, listen, listen, when you are being disciplined for a sin, or you need to learn to drop a weight that is sitting upon you, it's because God's got something new he wants to do with you. But he can't do it while that is still strapped to your ankles, or while you're still carrying that burden. He can't do that while you're carrying it still. He's got this new thing for you, but the problem is you're allowing whatever weight it is to hang on to you, or whatever sin it is to keep you shackled down. Do you get it? He wants you to run free in him, or in my case, swim free in him. But whilst you are not allowing him to deal with that habitual sin, or you're not taking off that weight that all of you quoted out, the Lord can't... There's a stumbling block. Does that make sense? And yet what he wants to do is by looking at this stuff that maybe God has spoken to you about this morning, is not see it in making yourself feel really condemned by it, but see it in the light of the fact that the Lord wants to do a new thing. See it in the light of hope. Does that make sense? See it like light like, like at the end of the tunnel. Somebody like the idea of crocuses coming into blue. I don't even know what crocus looks like, but amen. So the whole point being that just see that in that light. Do not see it to make you feel heavy and condemned. Yes, you have to deal with it. Yes, we have to give it to the Lord because he's holy. But see it in the light is because he wants to do something new. We sang that song earlier on. And open the floodgates of heaven, let it rain. He's always got the floodgates open, ready to go. But if we don't sort of get under those floods, if we, we can't make, because we're struggling with something, we almost stick the umbrella up instead. Yeah? But the Lord wants to bless and do something. So see all of this in the light of the fact that he wants to do something new. So strengthen your grip. Lift up your weakened knees. And allow God to deal with the weight and the sin that's going on inside of you. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.